We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Media and information literacy empowers people to think critically about information and use of digital tools. Media and information literacy helps people to make informed choices about how they participate in peace building, equality, freedom of expression, access to information and sustainable development goals in general. UNESCO supports and champions media and information literacy initiatives across the globe. We do this through actions, such as capacity building for various stakeholders, developing curricula for educators and learners to aid the integration of media and information literacy in all levels of education. Assisting governments and institutions to formulate national media and information literacy policies and strategies. Training journalists to promote media and information literacy to build trust in media. Strengthening international cooperation and raising awareness through the UNESCO Media and Information Literacy Alliance. Supporting youth organisations to integrate media and information literacy into their policies and operations and become peer educators online. Offering a suite of online media and information literacy courses, including ones for policymakers. Undertaking research with the UNESCO Media and Information Literacy and Intercultural Dialogue University Network. Organising the annual Global Media and Information Literacy Week. With this holistic approach and rich resources, we can help foster media and information literacy among people and communities across the globe. Here's how you can get involved in UNESCO's Media and Information Literacy initiatives and make a real difference in society. Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear participants at IGF Katowice and participants through our live stream, I wish to welcome you all to this UNESCO session, which is officially part of the Internet Governance Forum 2021 and which will focus on advancing international and multi-stakeholder efforts to promote media and information literacy online, and in particular, through digital platforms. What if we all govern the internet? This is the title of a study UNESCO published in 2017. The question, I think you would agree, remains equally valid to today, four years later. Since the internet is a shared public resource, it concerns obviously all of us. But what does it take to ensure that everyone is involved in shaping the norms and the rules that operate or do not operate different parts of the internet? Media and information literacy is a multivalent tool that can be used in this regard as it enables everyone, individuals, societies, academia, governments, companies, to play a proactive part in this process. At the same time, coordinated cooperation among all stakeholder groups is to sustain and improve the levels of media and information literacy in society. This in turn is key to ensure that informed and participatory multi-stakeholder approach governs the internet. This session, as you know, will focus on how we can advance an international multi-stakeholder framework for digital communication that enable private sector companies to promote media and information literacy in their policies and operations. This pioneering action follows the successful celebration last October 
of the UNESCO Global Media and Information Literacy Week, which, as you may recall, was hosted by South Africa and organized by UNESCO in cooperation with the European Commission. This year, the theme of our Global Media and Information Literacy Week was Media and Information Literacy for Public Good. We believe that this theme is still highly relevant for today's discussion. For the first time, this Global Week saw regional and international intergovernmental organizations, including the African Union, the Arab League, the Agent Cooperation Dialogue, and the European Commission expressing their commitment to fostering media and information literacy at the regional level, uh, but also enhancing global cooperation among different stakeholders. During the recently held 41st session of the UNESCO General Conference, numerous member states highlighted in their national statements the importance that media and information literacy plays. They also underscored the relevance of MIL by endorsing unanimously the principles of the Windhoek Plus 30 Declaration, which, as you may know, was adopted last May during our World Press Freedom Day celebration, which took place in Namibia. In accordance with the day's theme of information as a public good, one of the three key dimensions of the Windhoek Plus 30 Declaration focused on media and information literacy, calling on all governments to mainstream it in their strategies and action plans. A second key pillar of the Windhoek Plus 30 Declaration calls on technology companies to support information as a public good by ensuring the transparency of systems which affect how people interact online with digital content and to advance frameworks that promote media and information literacy. This is actually the precise purpose of our session this afternoon. We must bolster multilateral cooperation to deepen our understanding of the consequences that our fast moving realities may have on different societies, but also on different groups of people within these diverse societies. Media and information literacy is essential to convert users into active and informed agents when using digital services. This is essential to foster what UNESCO calls the internet universality, which is an internet governed by respect for what we call the Rome principle, R-O-A-M, meaning a human rights based, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder model of governance of the internet and other digital technologies. I hope that this brief introduction helps frame our discussion, and I hope that it enables us to focus on media and information literacy for all beneficiaries. It requires the multi-stakeholder cooperation I just referred to, whereby everyone is involved and everyone is empowered to contribute to its development and use. Now, please allow me to introduce our distinguished speakers for this session. And I would like to thank them for taking the time to share with us their insights, their perspectives, and their experiences. So we have this afternoon, Ms. Vera Jurova, Vice President and Commissioner of the European Commission. Ms. Siniad McSweeney, a Global Vice President of Public Policy at Twitter. Ms. Samia Bibers, Director at the Monitoring and Crisis Management Department in the Media and Information Sector of the Arab League. She'll be speaking this afternoon on behalf of the Secretary General of the League of Arab States. Ms. Silva Basher, 
founder of the Civil Society Association, Las Otras Voces, and member of the UNESCO Media and Information Literacy Alliance. Ms. Sonia Gil, Secretary General of the Caribbean Broadcasting Union. And Ms. Claire Devi, Director of Global Policy Programs at WhatsApp. Before I give the floor to our first speaker, I would like to thank the European Commission for its role in championing media and information literacy. The European Commission has been a long-standing and prominent partner of UNESCO, and I would like here to express my special thanks to Ms. Yorova, who has collaborated with UNESCO on several occasions in the past, and helped us to promote media and information literacy for all and ensure a prominent place for this subject on the international agenda. Ms. Yorova, welcome again, and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Yalasi, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, very kind words, which you have just said uh, on, on the address of the commission and myself, and thank you for inviting me uh, very much for for to, for this panel. Also, my greetings to Katowice, uh, which is close to my home, also to my heart. This is a very timely event, and I will not hide that I will, of course, tell you what the Commission is doing. But I will impatiently wait for the contributions of our co other co-speakers because uh, uh, media literacy is uh, uh, a fantastic topic which enables us to be creative and to go into the, the also new ways of, of doing things. So uh, it's a great opportunity for me. Um, we see now in, in today, uh, in this era of the pandemic, uh, uh, more than before, how media literacy is, is important. Because uh, such an avalanche of misinformation and disinformation uh, at unprecedented scale, we, we never saw it before. And especially now in the pandemic, uh, we see that this is the matter of health, of life or death, to either have trustworthy information or to be overloaded with disinformation, which really can, can do a big harm to, to us as individuals and also the society. So it's a very timely and important um, uh, uh, initiative that we continue uh, increasing our efforts to improve media literacy. Uh, together, we have to do it together in a whole of society approach. At least it's the, the commission approach uh, and it, you could see it in all our strategic papers uh, which are uh, relevant. Online platforms play a key role in this effort. Uh, this is why it is essential that they are, they are part of the dialogue, as it is the case in the panel today as well. Please let me highlight what we have been doing at the European level. We have issued last year in, in uh, December the so-called European Democracy Action Plan. The plan aims to improve the resilience of our democracies, because we found out in Europe that democracy will not protect itself, that it requires everyday work of everyone. And that's why this, this whole of society approach we try to take and invite the whole society uh, to, to, to help to protect democracy. Uh, coming back to the plan, it's built on three pillars, securing free and fair elections, the second is strengthening media freedom and pluralism, and the third is fighting disinformation. Uh, we want the citizens uh, of the EU to be still able to make informed choices and autonomous uh, choices and vote freely on the basis of facts and without manipulation. To do so, we have adopted and proposed rules to put some order in the online uh, sphere, making it more transparent. We have also increased our funding support. Uh, our revised audiovisual rules require EU member states to promote the development of media literacy skills. It also obliges video sharing platforms to set up effective media literacy measures and tools to help turn this requirement into reality 
we have been working with partners, including media regulators, online platforms, and other stakeholders on a toolbox. And the result of this work should be published soon. I tried to get to know more about where we are with uh, creating this toolbox before this, this debate today, but it is still too, too, uh, too raw, not mature enough, uh, but we will, we will soon have it ready after the new year. I also presented three, years, week, uh, three weeks ago a proposal on the transparency of political advertising. It's the part of what I said that we want to put some order in the, in the digital sphere. A recent survey suggests that 40% of respondents have difficulty recognizing organic from paid content. Once our new law is adopted, the users will be able to clearly distinguish the ads from organic content because paid content will be clearly labeled. Citizens will be able to know why they are seeing an ad, who paid for it, what data were used to target them. And this will clearly contribute to media literacy. I am, I am convinced about that. Let me also mention our work with online platforms of the code of practice uh, against disinformation. We had the first code already in 2018. Uh, but for many reasons, we needed to strengthen the code and we published our vision of how it should be uh, improved in May this year. And we asked for additional efforts to promote media literacy and tools such as trustworthiness indicators focused on the integrity of information sources. The new code will be ready by March next year and it will be linked in the future uh, to our proposed Digital Services Act, which means we are moving from pure self-regulation, if you like some gentlemen agreements we have as the digital platforms, towards the co-regulation. Uh, co-regulation means that we will have the Digital Services Act, which is legally binding set of rules for online sphere, and the code of practice against disinformation, which will be recognized as the mitigating factor uh, which should decrease the level of harm caused by disinformation. And I have to mention one thing. Uh, we make a very clear distinction between illegal content, which is hate speech, uh, extremism, terrorism, child pornography, and disinformation, which is legal speech, but harmful speech and sometimes dangerous speech. So that's why we take different ways how to, how to uh, minimize the, the bad impact. I am happy to see new signatories of the code of practice. Uh, I just on Monday agreed with Nick Clegg that WhatsApp is also joining the code as the new signatory. Let me also highlight that a big part of our work is also to protect and support media freedom and pluralism, because independent media journalists uh, especially are in the front line to fight disinformation. Media literacy can contribute to the sustainability of trustworthy media outlets as informed and empowered users will be more likely to consult such outlets. outlets. Uh, after the rules, let me give you some example of how we use EU funding to support media literacy. We are mobilizing different funding programs. For the first time, we will have at least 75 million euros for media pluralism and media freedom under the Creative Europe program. This is the budget for seven years. The first call for proposals related to media literacy will be published early in 22. We are also supporting the European Digital Media Observatory, so-called EDMO, uh, which brings together independent fact checkers and academic researchers working on the fight against disinformation. It also supports media literacy activities at national and multinational level. And Commission recently announced grants for a total amount of 11 million euros to establish eight EDMO regional hubs in different member states. We are supporting teachers and educators. Uh, as one example, we support the so-called e-twinning platform for teachers across Europe to communicate, collaborate, and develop projects. And this year, the priority is media literacy and the fight against disinformation. And of course, I have to mention also being in the, 
in the panel uh, organized by, by UNESCO in cooperation, uh, also with the Commission, international cooperation plays crucial role. And this is why it is important for me to be here today with you. Uh, I am very curious and looking forward to other panelists and I really seek to get more inspirations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jourova, for uh, your intervention and uh, information and uh, announcements which you made. Uh, I would like uh, now to proceed. Before I do that, I, uh, let me mention to our participants, in case they are not aware of it, that we have a dual English-French translation. And if they click on the button on the lower uh, right-hand side of the screen, then they can choose the language that suits them. Uh, UNESCO uh, would like also to thank Twitter for uh, its uh, cooperation on promoting media and information literacy. And we certainly look forward to continuing our work with uh, uh, Twitter to place this topic on the global agenda. I, I would like now to give the floor to Ms. Sinead Maxweni, Global Vice President of Public Policy at Twitter. Good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate today. Um, it's great to contribute to what is a really critical and important conversation um, and to do so um, as part of our ongoing and, and valuable partnership with UNESCO on media and information uh, literacy um, is even more satisfying. It's, it's really exciting work and I, I know that, that the people from Twitter who are involved in that partnership are uh, really motivated um, and excited by it. Um, you know, when you look at it, the open internet um, has, has effectively put a, a user-friendly tap on the world's reservoir of information. Um, but that means that we are sometimes overwhelmed with information. There's so much information available now on demand. And people of all ages um, are left kind of trying to parse between what's credible, what's not, um, and, and kind of honing that capacity to consume, digest, and understand information requires uh, the development of media and information literacy skills. Um, I, I was struck myself here at home uh, the other night by my 12 year old would have been asked to do a project on the Universal Declaration on Human Rights from school. And he started opining on something and I was like, where did you hear that? And he said, Google said. And I said, well, actually, Google didn't say anything. Google doesn't say anything about the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. You were signposted by a search engine to a website which is giving a view on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Tell me who is running that website. And I said, it can be anybody from you know, the UN to Human Rights Watch to Amnesty International to a particular government offering a defense of their record on human rights. And it was like a mini lesson on um, you know, that, that sense of identifying what's important and, and what's critical in that moment. And it reminded me of, you know, I will sometimes be contacted and somebody would say, Twitter is saying, and I'll go, Twitter is not saying anything. People who use the Twitter platform are saying, did you check the profile? Did you see who it was? Is it reputable information? So I think it highlights the different elements of our work here as a company so that we can, we can play our part in promoting that media and information literacy and, and talk about that. And then the second part is our own responsibilities and duties and obligations as a company to challenge harmful disinformation. So there's the enhancing the skill set amongst the people who are consuming the information, and then our responsibility and our work, whether it's through our product or policy, um, to enable them to deploy those literacy skills um, in, in a reliable and, and safe environment. And underpinning all of that then is, is Twitter's advocacy for the open internet and a support for international frameworks such as, as what we're talking about today. So starting with that, that, that piece, um, 
which I find particularly engaging, the promotion of media and information literacy. And, you know, we, we champion the free flow of information and people's right to expression online. Um, and those complementary commitments intersect where, where we discuss this particular issue and that sense of empowering people to uh, use Twitter to engage critically with the content that we see. Um, and so the partnerships that we have operate at national level, regional level, global level. Uh, here in Ireland, where, where I'm based, we work with Media Literacy Ireland and we support their Be Media Smart campaign. We've done so over the past few years, encouraging people to stop, think, check the veracity of information and um, helping parents like myself, I suppose, to challenge uh, kids as they, they, they take, um, they head to the internet to, to do their homework. At the global level, as we've already mentioned, we have this incredible um, partnership with UNESCO since 2018. Um, in 2019, we launched our teaching and learning with Twitter handbook, um, and this was developed for educators um, of all of all uh, kinds and exploring how to teach media and information literacy skills in the digital age. And it's now localized into over 10 languages with ambition on our part to, to do even more. Um, and you know, that partnership then continues participating in events like Global Media and Information Literacy Week. And, and we continue to explore ways to, to um, expand that partnership and just get the maximum reach that we can globally um, right into 2022. So that's the media and information literacy part. It's powerful and it's, and it's essential and, and it's exciting work, but sometimes interventions um we, we we need interventions which have a a more immediate and decisive short-term impact and that's where our responsibilities as a platform come in and in making those decisions our focus is very much on the potential for harm so across three core areas it is how we look at it synthetic and manipulated media elections and of course, COVID-19, uh, which has been now with us for uh, almost two years, our approach to misleading information is determined by that concept of harm. And Commissioner Yurova referred to that, that concept as well. Um, is, a piece of media, is a piece of media maliciously designed to mislead people? Um, are people manipulating election outcomes by distributing false information about how people should participate in, in, in the democratic process. And um, is someone suggesting that others should try an unproven so-called cure um, for COVID? Um, and so those are the questions that we mull over as we decide how to intervene in particular cases. Will somebody be hurt uh, by this information? Will society be damaged by this information? And our interventions are designed then to mitigate that harm. Um, but the main thing that we discovered in 2020, we actually had a public consultation looking for feedback from people on Twitter, experts, academics, and others about how we should be doing this work. And one thing was clear, and that was that they didn't want Twitter determining the truthfulness or otherwise of information, but that they did want us to provide context and additional information to allow people to make up their own minds um, when when the substance of a tweet is disputed. So then we so we had to look at in product um, and other policy changes to enable that looking at how content is amplified on the platform, how people can be directed to reliable sources. And we've made other changes such as labeling, moving away from that, you know, take down or, or stay up um, concept of content moderation um, pointing people to a collection of authoritative sources on a particular um, issue, kind of linking that out of a disputed tweet. Um, know the facts prompts so that when people search on these critical issues like mental health, COVID-19, elections, that they're signposted to authoritative sources and we work closely with health health um, health services and health authorities in different countries retweet prompts you know asking somebody uh, when it's clear they haven't read an article 
um, why they're retweeting it. And would they like to, to reconsider that? Um, and then we have the um, Birdwatch project, uh, the pilot project, uh, where we, we have this community based approach to annotating um, tweets and where, where there are um, question marks over uh, whether they are accurate or not. Um, so all of those uh, moves and tactics by us combined with the media and literacy information, uh, literacy skills work, um, encompass a strategy for counting harmful disinformation and thereby improve and protect the open internet for all. Um, and and that, that concept of protecting the open internet is something that's bigger than, than any one company. Like the power of an open internet is obvious. It goes, it goes without saying it has been a force for good, but it's also been used for ill. And how do we protect the good and continue to confront the bad? Um, and, and we see governments all over the world grappling with that challenge as we speak. Um, but we are concerned that some of the measures that are being proposed may have the opposite effect. And so therefore it's really important that whether it's individual governments or an international framework, that there are certain fundamental principles that would underpin our work here. Um, and, and they would be that the open internet is global, it should be available to all, and should be built on open standards and the protection of human rights. Uh, trust is essential and trust um, is built on transparency and fairness and privacy protections. Um, we believe that recommendation and ranking algorithm, algorithms, um, it's, there's not much point in working in tech and not being able to pronounce algorithm, um, uh, they should be subject to human choice and control. And that content moderation is more than just leave up or take down. And we recently published a paper on all of this that I would ask uh, people to take the time to read. I think we've seen how multi-stakeholder governance model works. We've seen it in the EU. Commissioner Eurova has been um, a magnificent champion of that. Uh, we've had it in the EU Code of Practice on Disinformation, the EU Code of Conduct on Countering Illegal Hate Speech. Um, and, and we've seen how those codes have evolved and being iterated on. Uh, and we, we believe that is the way forward. And we look forward to continuing it at EU level, but also taking the learnings from that and bringing it globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. McSweeney. Uh, you certainly, uh, you are certainly right in mentioning accountability, transparency, and trust as fundamental when it comes to digital content, but also to the moderation of content that we find on the internet. And the other key issue that I think we are all struggling with, how can we combat uh, misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, while ensuring the freedom of expression online? Uh, we don't have a definite answer to that, but we will keep uh, joining forces to address it. Uh, let's uh, now move to our third uh, speaker. And uh, as an introduction, I want to state that UNESCO is committed to strengthening its cooperation with the League of Arab States to promote uh, media and information literacy. Uh, actually, UNESCO supports the Arab states uh, in identifying strategic approaches and possible partnerships in media and information literacy. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Bibars for her third uh, appearance on a UNESCO panel uh, on a topic related to media and information literacy. Ms. Bibars, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good afternoon, everybody uh, from Cairo. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to participate today in the Internet Governance Forum, a unique gathering organized by the UNESCO in collaboration with the European Commission and the UNESCO Media and Information Literacy Alliance. I would like to express the League of Arab States appreciation to the UNESCO for its exerted efforts in terms of dissemination of media and information literacy, aiming to ensure it for all as a public good. I also seize this opportunity to reaffirm the League's willingness to widen and deepen its partnership with the UNESCO in terms of promoting MIL, aiming to combat misinformation, raising awareness of online risks, promoting equality of opportunity, tolerance, human rights, as well as helping individuals to make informed economic decisions as media consumers. A distinguished guest, in a deregulated market-driven economy, 
people need to be responsible for their own behavior as consumers, rather than depending on the government's regulations to protect them from the negative aspects of market forces, they need to learn how to protect themselves. Therefore, media and information literacy is crucial for full and active citizenship through creating well-behaved, self-regulating citizens consumers. Although media and information literacy is essentially as reg regulatory initiative, it also has the dimensions of inclusion and participation, aiming to ensure that everyone has the skills to use technology, including digital media for full participation in society. Among other things, MIL seems to involve developing skills in handling technology, critical analysis of digital media, enhancing creative self-expression, promoting the inclusion of excluded groups in using technology, protecting children against harmful content, and raising their awareness of online risks. In this context, it's necessary to formulate binding policies on media literacy, as well as integrating it in the educational curriculums at schools and universities, aiming to ensure its dissemination. Education is more important than regulation. It also might be useful to design benchmarks to, to measure the individual's access and functional operational skills. For example, how frequently do people go online? How many functions do they use on their mobile phone? How efficient are their online search skills? Ladies and gentlemen, in the digital era we are living in, media is changing in many ways, ranging from the way people perceive it to the way it's operated as a business. We all well know that many media companies are commercial entities which operate on competition basis. Therefore, we have to accept that media is a business which has sustainability concerns just as any other business. Consequently, it's necessary having the adequate skills to understand what is required for media business prospects and sustainability, as well as identifying main stakeholders of media business. Also disruptive innovations and technologies brought by giant digital media companies such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter are forcing media managers to be more literate than ever due to being challenged in terms of digital advertising revenues. Therefore, digital media literacy became essential and indispensable for digital communication companies. Digital literacy makes good business sense. A digitally literate for workforce can help business sell products and services. In today's digital ecosystem, understanding how channels work, having the capability how to use data to deal with with customers, as well as having an informed conversation with, the, with, with them, the customers, of course, are vital skills marketers need in order to make strategic decisions and to gain business value. Distinguished guests, developing an international multi-stakeholder framework, framework for digital communications companies is undoubtedly a useful approach in terms of promoting MIL. The main stakeholders are governments, digital communication companies, media managers, marketers, customers, comp competitors, international and regional inter intergovernmental organizations, and civil society institutions. All these stakeholders should work together to address the MIL challenges. In this context, it's necessary to issue pro-technology regulations and to launch initiatives to ensure an ongoing focus on digital innovations, as well as the needed knowledge and skills to upgrade and upskill the employees working in the digital communication companies. Areas of focus are also include ethical online advertising, quality standards for media content, and developing a digital media literacy strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, before concluding, I would like to point out that in the face of today's widespread lack of digital media literacy, we might allow machines to assist us in better understanding, interpreting, and evaluating news information and data. Artificial intelligence is one of those technologies that directly lends itself to help supporting digital media literacy efforts. It is important that the foundation 
of the uh, of the AI of the artificial intelligence uh, um, uh, is built uh, ethically with a diverse team of programmers to ensure it's free of bias. Finally, I would like again to extend my thanks and gratitude to the UNESCO for giving me this opportunity to be a panelist and a key speaker in such a very interesting session. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Ms. Bibers, for your intervention. Uh, you mentioned in the concluding part the increasing importance of artificial intelligence and the need to ethically develop and use and deploy AI-based systems. Uh, let me here just share a piece of news that maybe some of our participants are not aware of. A couple of weeks ago at the UNESCO 41st session of the General Conference, our 193 member states adopted uh, the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. This is the first of its kind worldwide. It's a normative instrument that we are making available to 193 countries to use. And now after this adoption, we are moving to the implementation of this ground, uh, groundbreaking recommendation. So you are absolutely right. Uh, technologies and especially AI needs to be developed, used, deployed in an ethical way, in a human-centered uh, way. Let me now move on to our next speaker, uh, who is the founder of Las Otras Voces, a non-profit civil association that has played an active role in setting the educational agenda of media and information literacy through the creation of programs and establishing alliances, both in Latin America, but also in Spain. We are pleased to have her a member of the UNESCO AMAEL Alliance and to have her obviously on this panel. Let me give the floor now to Ms. Sylvia Bashar. For me, it's good afternoon. I am in Argentina. As uh, my colleague said, I want to thank the UNESCO the Internet Governance Forum, the European Union for inviting me to participate in this meeting. The topic addressed in this panel is urgent and challenging in order to think about such a particular time in the history of humanity in which a global pandemic encloses and at the same time connect us through virtuality. A pandemic that deepen inequality in pre-existing structures, gaps, stru structural gaps in dimension of all kinds, economic, social, gender, environment, education, among others. My experience in the media and information literacy field began three decades ago. Then, and until not so long ago, MIL was the responsibility of formal education. Schools and their teachers had to take this challenge in their hands, but they did not have the training to do so. In the meantime, governments sent technology to the classrooms without taking into account the complex social cultural transformation that had a direct impact on the health of the school and society as a whole. In Spanish, we have a, a, an image that explains this. For decades, we looked at the tree without being able to see the forest. The school was asked to resolve the in solitude a challenge of era, a deep transformation that involved in this culture and involved it in this culture and transformation. Fortunately, today we know that MIL is the responsibility of many, indeed of all social, cultural, political, and economic actors in a world without virtual borders. Therefore, as a member of UNESCO 
Media and Information Literacy Alliance, let me say that this panel on MIL is in this forum is an event that should be celebrated. The history of media and information literacy is extensive, and I am not going to share it at this time, but I would like to point that in Latin America, research and experiences have been key to the development of policies and laws that, although insufficient, are beginning to have visibility in areas outside the education system. And the media education and media law, for example, already uh, are already incorporated in MIL concepts, with that, which has a positive impact as policies begin to give visibility to MIL issues. This expansion of media information literacy in digital spaces and media is fast and presents new challenges. However, we must understand plenty of the previous existing challenges have not been solved. And that happens in large because part, eh, large part because of the complexity of the point out, of I, that I point out. The school alone could not solve them, nor could any of the stakeholder in isolation. The school alone cannot solve it. Remember this and also any of the stakeholders in isolation could do. Nowadays, the importance of MIL is more than ever due to the rapid advance of algorithms and artificial intelligence, was a just a comment, in the lives of people and societies in all their dimension. It is necessary, as I said, that the tree does not prevent us from the seeing the forest, a forest that is none other than an ecosystem that we inhabit as humanity, wherever as producer, consumer, or prosumer. That is why MIL, Media and Information Literacy, must occupy, occupy a key place in the public agenda. Before moving on, I would like to remind you that when we talk about MIL, we are talking about basic human rights. Why? Because MIL involves the right to education, the right to communication, freedom of press, of press the right to information, the right to expression, the right to participation, access to connectivity, and comprehensive and sustainable use of technology, among others. The most important thing is that this right should reach, should reach all human beings, minor, minorities of all kinds, children, others, and seniors, without distinction of gender or limitation by condition of any kinds. The MIL is a bridge, a network, an opportunity to stop in the media and digital maelstrom to think about citizens and their rights. Implicit in MIL is the ability to read the world with a critical eye, to tell it, to create, and of course, to communicate in order to influence and transform it. But for this to happen, not only traditional educational spaces must be involved, because this responsibility includes people, companies of all kinds, social movements, societies, governments, and also cities, MIL cities. The MIL is a way to promote participatory citizenship in a world that digital preeminence. This is indicated in the Seoul Declaration on Media and Information Literacy for Everyone and by Everyone, a defense against this infodemic 2020. Media and information is a core competency of addressing this infodemia, contributing to access to information, freedom of, freedom of expression, protection of privacy, prevention of violence, extremism, promotion of digital security, and combating hate speech and inequality. Also, that it promotes diversity, 
particularly in terms of the ability of marginalized people to create and disseminate content and expression their world view and intercultural view also, it was said in the first presentation. As we have said, transformation is only possible if a collective commitment is built. Sustainability action and partnership are needed beyond short-term initiatives. In part, by governments taking responsibility and providing budget for a diversity of media and information literacy program, the media taking on the urgent commitment to train the, the professional who work there in their different roles to understand how to report on children, youth and vulnerable minorities and why to open their microphones to them. Teacher guiding children and youth to find their own voices, young people claiming their rights. These are just a few of many other references that, that will warrant this transformation. We are convinced about the benefits of media and information literacy to media and digital platforms, sustainability and transparency. Don't hesitate. It's urgent to advance international, international multi-stakeholders framework for private digital platform media to promote media and information, and infor, information literacy. Is it a collective challenge? And MIL is an unique opportunity to promote inclusive, democratic, diverse society, and more than better informed voices, more plural, as I said, more democratic, more ethical and sensitive. Thank you very much. I feel proud to be able to, in, to be part of this uh, forum. And I thank for you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Bashar, for uh, this interesting perspective coming from a civil society association. This, of course, civil society plays a key role in what we advocate a truly multi-stakeholder approach uh, to this topic. Uh, thank you. In, in, as an introduction to our next speaker, let me say that the Caribbean Broadcasting Union is the only pan-Caribbean association with media houses from 15 nations of the Caribbean community. Uh, a long-time partner of UNESCO, the Caribbean Broadcasting Union brings together public service and commercial broadcasters in the region. Today, we know that broadcasting media is key to foster media and information literacy also through digital spaces. I would like to invite Ms. Sonia Jill, Secretary General of the Caribbean Broadcasting Union. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, moderator. And I extend very warm greetings from the Caribbean Broadcasting Union on behalf of our president, our board of directors, and our 37 members in the Dutch, English, French, and Spanish Caribbean. We're really grateful to UNESCO for the invitation to speak to this workshop. And I must say, I'm pretty pleased with how I've been placed in this uh, discussion because what I have to say, I think will uh, resonate with what has been said by the previous speakers. I, however, believe that the perspective of the Caribbean media organizations are very relevant given our positioning at a crossroads, geographically, technologically, and socially. We sit between South and North America, but we have a distinct identity that defies efforts to classify us as Latin American or group us with North America. Our legacy media established as part of national independence efforts are also at a crossroads as they seek to restructure as public service media, very often without any kind of state subvention in a context of fierce competition in a largely privatized media environment. And in doing so, Caribbean media are also having a middle ground experience in terms of digital technology. 
Now, they've come a long way from their origins as highly centralized, unidirectional analog facilities, providing content dominated by extra regional sources and mores. While the streaming multi-channel outlets, such as One Spot Media, the RGR Galena Group in Jamaica, and Tele Curacao's Carib Flicks, are in the vanguard of indigenous Caribbean digital media, all of the members of the CBU and the wider Caribbean media sector have some kind of online presence and they're growing rapidly beyond their roots in traditional radio broadcast or cable television or print. These experiences, while they may seem specific to the Caribbean, actually have something to offer in terms of today's discussion on a multi-stakeholder framework for media and information literacy in digital contexts. And in these couple of minutes, I just want to highlight a couple of principles I believe need to be embedded in that framework that we are developing. The first one I want to refer to is collaboration. And I was thinking a little bit about the work done by Helmut Wagner in sign symbols and interaction theory, not to get too theoretical here, but it was important, I think, to come back to this discussion to talk about creation of meaning. It's not a process of just objectively interpreting symbols. Meaning is always, as he said, subjectively intended and interpreted and is always culturally derived. Here in the Caribbean, an example is the word hush. It's used very often in the English-based Creole of Jamaica. But in the rest of the Caribbean, it can be interpreted as a rude injunction to be silent, even though it's actually meant to express sympathy and offer comfort. Caribbean media over the decades through institutions such as the CBU and the Caribbean News Agency known as CANA have had a good deal of valuable experience in demonstrating how collaboratively working on media content meant for audiences from diverse language groups with varied cultural experiences can be done with success. And I'd like to posit that collaboration is fundamental to developing media and information literacy. Recognizing from the get-go that different meanings are going to be generated by those experiencing the content from varied perspectives, but it is possible to achieve common understanding through collaborative efforts. The second principle I wanted to, to raise, and it's been discussed so far very eloquently, is accountability. And I won't take up your time elaborating on current events, which have brought to mind the absence of a culture of accountability in large part in the production of a lot of media content that we're seeing deliberately designed to misinform and even cause harm. Now, the straits that we find ourselves in at this point, while they are totally unacceptable, are quite foreseeable. Media influence is social, political, and economic power, and power always attracts those who wish to misuse it. Now, while systems of regulation can themselves be corrupted and abused, that does not mean that we do away with them altogether. And I am happy to hear from the other panelists their own thoughts on this. Um, I wanted to say, however, that the process of media and information literacy is bolstered by regulation, by methods of holding responsible those who deliberately seek to do harm. And accountability has to be accepted by all stakeholders, including media content users, but particularly by those who are literally profiting from that content. And again, the experience of the Caribbean in this respect has been useful. We have seen the production of state-supported instruments for holding those who are doing harm accountable. Uh, for example, we have the Children's Code for Programming, which indicates a role for the producers and the distributors of content in a process of co-regulation, as mentioned before. 
Although its origins were in legacy media, there is broad recognition that the time has passed for the digital media environment to also be subject to these kinds of accountability mechanisms well supported by media and information literacy capacity building. And the third principle I wanted to, to speak to is resources. As already mentioned, just like ordinary literacy and numeracy, media and information literacy must be a work of structured capacity building of education. But as Sylvia says, not just the education sector. We have to be together as stakeholders, bringing the resources, both human and material, to this work. Uh, a worthy example, again, from the Caribbean, piloted in Jamaica by the National Media Regulator, the Broadcasting Commission, worked with the University of the West Indies Department responsible for teacher education. And that collaboration actually produced audiovisual teaching content on different aspects of media and information literacy for use by teachers who were working with cohorts of children under the age of 11. So we had a teaching resource but you had a regulator a part of the process and you had the media sector part of the process. It was welcomed by all. And if you're interested, you can check the website of the Broadcasting Commission for more information on the results and the ongoing impact. And of course, I want to note with interest in our discussion, the manual produced by UNESCO for media and information literacy and journalism. And I'm looking forward to seeing that translated into practical capacity building program for the producers of content, both individually and institutionally. Fortunately, since the CBU has recently joined the Media and Information Literacy Alliance, we believe we're well positioned to actively participate in that capacity building effort for our member organizations and their personnel, supported by our Caribbean team of the MIL Alliance, as well as the Latin America and Caribbean chapter. I do hope these few thoughts have been of interest and let me reiterate the commitment of Caribbean media to advancing this cause of media and information literacy. It is a life and death matter and we need to come to grips with it even as we deal with the opportunities and challenges of the digital environment. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jill, for your intervention. Uh, I take away from it the three key points you made about the need of collaboration and the creation of meaning, establishing a culture of accountability and the crucial importance of resources, of course, going forward. Thank you for that. Before I give the floor to our last speaker, last panelist, I would like to uh, uh, announce to our participants, both at AGF in Katowice, but also our live stream participants, that they can use for IGF participants. You can post your questions through the Q&A box. And for our live stream participants, if you would like to post a question, you can use the chat box. Uh, our last speaker uh, for this panel is Ms. Claire Devi, who heads a global policy at WhatsApp. Her work focuses on creating cross-sectoral partnerships for sustainable social impact. She founded Facebook's hashtag She Means Business program, providing education resources, training, and outreach in the area of digital and media li literacy. Ms. Devi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, and it's been fantastic to hear from all the speakers, uh, particularly Ms. Jill, who was just before me talking about collaboration. As you mentioned, my background is in cross-sector partnerships. So hearing that collaboration is key to so many of the panelists has been fantastic. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of the areas that we've been working on across three different parts. Firstly, um, what we're able to do in our product. In terms of the product, what we try and do, given that we are an encrypted private message space and are unable to see the content that people are sharing, what are the nudges that we can use to encourage people to make um, smart decisions or informed decisions about the content that they see? 
So in 2018, what we introduced was a limit to how many chats at a time someone could forward a message to. So as private message space, we're interested in small conversations as opposed to things going viral. And what we saw then was a 20% reduction in the amount of messages that were forwarded. We started to label these messages as forwarded as well so people could see and understand that the message didn't come from the person who sent it. We then went one step further around something we called highly forwarded messages. And these are messages that have been sent at least five times. And we label these messages now with two arrows. So to put that in context, you know, not only is it not from my mother or father or sister, it's not even from somebody who sent it to them. It's gone through at least five people. And with the introduction of this into the product, this nudge, what we saw was a 70% reduction in the number of highly forwarded messages that were on WhatsApp. The next thing that I'm going to talk about is fact checking. And in 2016, Facebook started a fact checking program with the International Fact Checking Network. And since that time, this, this partnership with Facebook has grown to around 60 languages in the world and around 80 partnerships. As that progressed, we saw an opportunity for WhatsApp to be part of that fact checking. And we have launched with the International Fact Checking Network and a number of organizations such as Mafindo in Indonesia, fact checking chatbots. And in these, what an individual can do is post a keyword, a hyperlink or a story into the chatbot and the chatbot will return to them if there is any information on whether it is true, false or in question. The other purpose that that surfaces in addition to providing um, information to people is it helps the fact checkers to see what information is top of mind for people and understand if there are stories that they are missing or things that they should be aware of. The next thing that I will focus on, again, in the spirit of collaboration, is understanding how we can work with researchers and how we can look at new and interesting ways of tackling misinformation. So in 2018, we funded research with the University of Cambridge around a thing called inoculation theory. Now, with inoculation theory, um, what these researchers came up with was the idea of exposing people through gamification through using games, simulations, and they ask you to take on the role of somebody who is trying to spread misinformation. And when you first look at this theory, it seems very counterintuitive because it feels like you are teaching people how to share misinformation. But what the research has shown, and WhatsApp has just funded an extension of that research to trial in five more countries, is that people are more likely to be able to identify misinformation after they've been through this simulation and seen how it is generated. And the research also found that this effect was not just immediate after it, but in coming back to people, that that effect was long lasting. So we want to see how this works in a number of different cultural nuances and what we can do to use this idea of inoculating and gamification, particularly for audiences who perhaps feel that they already understand or can identify misinformation. So we're trying to look at ways of education partnerships of not just the lowest of digital literacy, but perhaps the people who think they know better or think they already understand. The last two areas that I'm going to talk about quickly are just local partnerships that we've done, because to the point that many of the previous panelists made um, for any of these interventions, particularly on the education side to work, while as WhatsApp, we understand the technology and we understand what it can do, we will never have the depth of understanding of the local nuance of how to land it. We don't have the experience with the pedagogy in Indonesia or with what the creative aspects are in Nigeria. So two examples I'll share with you. One is a partnership in Indonesia that we have been working on for two years with two organisations. One is called ICT Watch and one is called ECTPAT. And over the course of the last 12 months in, in particular, we've actually worked through six different types of interventions. And this has included the production of online courses with the partners, resources for teachers, 
it's recorded what we call bite-sized content. So if we found that for many people, trying to absorb a huge amount of education in one go is quite overwhelming or they're on low bandwidth. So we've given them the opportunity to take things down into these much smaller pieces. The part of that, though, that I am kind of most proud of and really has had a significant impact was we worked with ICT Watch to identify 60 youth ambassadors from right across Indonesia and provided them education, not just on media and digital literacy, but also on how to create content. And they have then worked in their local communities, creating all kinds of content across social media and taken on the role as an ambassador to their community. And this is um, not just benefiting media literacy, but it's setting them up in terms of careers and creators in the future as well. The last partnership um, that I will share with you, and um, if unfortunately I'm not able to share at the moment, so I can't share the audio clips that I had prepared, which is a shame because it would have been a lovely way to end. Um, but we've worked in Nigeria and in Nigeria, we wanted to really ensure, because it's the first time that WhatsApp had done any kind of outreach or education, that what we created was very local and was going to resonate. So what we have trialled, and it's live in Nigeria at the moment, is a series of jingles on the radio called the Media Hypes, which are longer discussions about understanding literacy and misinformation, and then also some Vox Pops. And we've run these on very local radio stations in five different languages. Now, when we ran focus groups on what we had created, some of the feedback included people asking us for the jingles so they could share it on. 100% um, of the people in the focus groups felt that they had learned more about how to identify misinformation. But the other really interesting part for me was the focus group sat across demographics. And what we saw was with the younger demographic, they really liked the short, sharp, the songs, the jingles. The older demographic actually preferred the longer things where people talk them through step by step. So again, this goes back to in everything you produce and in all the partnerships we have, really understanding who is the audience, right down to the country and the focused audience inside that and making sure that whatever intervention you do, it's going to be relevant to them. And I think if you look across all the things I've spoken on, you've got to have a mix of all those things. What are the interventions in your product that you can do? What is the role around fact checking and research to contribute to the greater knowledge on this tricky subject? And third, investing in local education. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Devi, uh, and um, your inputs on the crucial importance of fact checking and how you go about that and the impressive number of partnerships that you set up uh, regarding this matter but also what you shared with us about tackling misinformation. Uh, let me hear, we have now uh, about uh, 10 minutes left for q and A. I I know that Ms. Uh, Yurova ha has to leave us quite uh, soon. One question that came to my attention was how to protect human rights on social media? So of course, this is a broad question. Uh, it is uh, quite a sensitive matter, politically charged sometimes, but of course it's fundamental. I mean, we, we did uh, a bit touch on this when I think it was uh, the first speakers talked about how to combat misinformation while ensuring freedom of expression. So the point here is how to protect the human rights on social media. Ms. Yurova, since you have to leave us quite soon, I give you the floor first. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for this in, indeed very, very complex and, and broad question, which I might uh, be able to reply in a simple way. How to protect fundamental rights online? By being very tough and demanding and insisting that all the rights which we have developed over de decades, if not centuries, for normal life of people, for offline, for our modern civilization, all these rights have to be respected and enforced also when it comes to online. So this is behind the philosophy we do uh, in, in Europe, or we use in European Union, 
It started already with GDPR, with the Data Protection Regulation. Now it goes through the Digital Services Act and other pieces of work that we have in the center of our interest and effort, the individual citizen of the EU, not consumer, citizen, who has the fundamental rights guaranteed by the Charter and by international uh, treaties, uh, by, by many different uh, documents. And we want this person to enjoy these rights also when he or she moves to online sphere. How to do that? Not to invent the wheel, not to create new uh, rights for online. No, we want to, in, we are insisting that the existing rights are fully respected and enforced. How to do that? It requires a lot of cooperation also on the rules, uh, uh, which are pushing the platforms to uh, guarantee the respect for the rights. Uh, we need a lot of cooperation with the tech, with the media, with the international organizations, because this will not happen overnight. We, we saw, we lived for a long time in a very naive conviction that for the internet, uh, there should be no rules, no rights, that it is just a, a new world which lives its own life. It is very dangerous and very naive, and we want to stop it. And I appreciate the cooperation also with tech and with, with other, other stakeholders, which are also participating on this international platform. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to future cooperation. We are doing something extremely important. Thank you very much. Let me here maybe share uh, one view on this matter from UNESCO and the work that has been uh, uh, ongoing here as far as the issue of how to ensure freedom of expression online while combating misinformation. We recognize uh, a couple of uh, widely used approaches. One is laissez-faire attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is, uh, you mentioned, uh, Ms. Yorova, uh, the, the internet being the wild west, you know, laissez-faire. The other approach is regulation. But with regulation, sometimes you fall into over-regulation, which of course goes against the freedom of expression. So we have been lately working on the a third way, which we call uh, uh, the, the transparency uh, of internet companies and digital platforms. And uh, we came up with the 26 high level, uh, let's say uh, principles to ensure much stronger transparency. But of course, the key question is transparency for whom? Over what? How far do we go about that? For what type of expected outcomes? Mm -hmm. So these are the issues that we, as we speak, are working on to, to uh, in partnership with the digital companies, with the internet firms, uh, uh, in a truly multi-stakeholder approach, public, private sector, academia, civil society, of course, etc. So thank you for your inputs to this complex matter, as you called it. Uh, I think we have to join forces to be uh, to do something about this. Let me look at our next questions here. How can social media platforms promote MIL, media and information literacy, learning in digital spaces and ensure that is sustainable? How can social media platforms promote MIL in digital spaces and ensure its sustainability down the road? Uh, who among the other panelists would like to maybe take a view on this. Maybe some of the platform companies, since the question is very much, how can social media platforms promote MIL learning in digital space in a sustainable way? I think, I, I, I mean, I think both Please. of them, this is Sinead from Twitter. Um, I think both Claire and, and myself have, have highlighted some of the initiatives um, that that companies like ourselves have embarked on. Um, I, I think there are a couple of elements to it um, that in order for the work to be sustainable, the partnerships need to be sustainable. Um, and that's why I think it's, it's important that we choose a combination of um, you know, global organizations that have significant reach um, like yourselves, 
um, and then work locally um, as, as we do in many parts of the world. And, and Claire gave the example of, of their work in Nigeria that is really bespoke to particular challenges uh, that, that can exist. Um, I, I agree very much with, with Commissioner Yurova that this sense of that, that online is different is, is, is misplaced and naive is, is also a good word, good word for it. I mean, it, I, I often say there are no new problems in the world. We just, they're just the same old problems, uh, but taking place in a, in, in a different environment and, and we just require more innovative solutions. So in the same way that we have, you know, used schools, used parenting, used all of these things to um, instill a sense of civic duty and um, citizenship, um, that those same skills, those same um, approaches to life and life's decisions and life's problems, um, we need to incorporate into school curricula, into um, after school activities, but also then try and reach the people who are out of formal education as well. So um, I, I think it's being, being nimble and agile, um, but also being consistent um, in terms of the type of messaging that we're trying to get across to people about being but engaging critically with information. Um, we could also just try teaching philosophy in schools, which um, is always something that I uh, that that I'm a, that I'm a big fan of. Just that ability to to encourage critical thinking uh, amongst everybody. Thank you, Miss McSweeney. Uh, Miss Devi, uh, anything to add uh, on this specific question from your side? I think Sinead has done a phenomenal job kind of summarizing it. I think the one piece I would add on top of that, that we're seeing real uptick in is investing in the creator economy. So this is both in terms of um, educating around a level of responsibility on what you create, but also giving them the skills and the opportunity to create and share content that addresses media literacy and fact-checking and understanding where information comes from. And I think that layers really nicely on top of taking a pedagogical approach with the education sector, taking a media approach with what you push out in terms of content and bringing those together. Thank you. And let me uh, invite uh, Ms. Bibars, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Jill, and also Ms. Bashar, in case they have a, really a, 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 a one minute concluding message before we wrap up the session. Ms. Bibars. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, just to uh, give a, a, a very uh, a small and very short uh, intervention uh, regarding how to, uh, um, uh, how to protect the uh, human rights, especially the, 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 the freedom of expression uh, in terms of uh, uh, social media or digital media. Uh, um, I would like to just again to, uh, uh, to emphasize on two issues. The first issue is to, to emphasize on the, um, the, 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 the ethics, I mean, the ethical guidelines, which we need to follow uh, in order to uh, protect the human rights and especially the, 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 the freedom of expression. Uh, uh, the, the second issue, it's again, uh, which I need also to emphasize, it's again the education, the, uh, the importance of education, the importance of integrating MIL in the schools and university curriculums, uh, which is, I think it is much more important even to when uh, more important than issuing regulations. The re regulations is, is on one hand is important, uh, but on the other hand, education is much more important than uh, issuing re regulations. So, uh, 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 I would like to conclude by uh, we have we need to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, um, let's say to design certain uh, ethical uh, benchmarks or ethical guidelines for the participation on the uh, uh, on the uh, digital media which the participants have the follow to follow and uh, and as well we need to put some regulations but on the other hand. We need to emphasize on the uh, importance of integration of uh, the MIL in the uh, in the educational process, uh, which I think this is much more important than uh, issuing regulations. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Basher. I think uh, you would like to say something. 
I would like uh, at the beginning, it's really interesting, all the uh, really interesting, all the point of view, but I would like to ask something. What means education? Because when mostly when we talk about education, we talk about school. And we know because UNESCO debate uh, during a long time that UNESCO, that the right of education is long life and intercultural and for everybody, not only at school. I think this is the commitment and the account accountability that uh, all the society, all the platforms, all the media, uh, and also the school, of course, uh, should understand that education is a right for everybody and that everybody is responsible. It's not only the school, the responsible to, uh, to take uh, advantage of this um, situation so special because we have the opportunity to build a new world. The, this digital environment really can, can do it. And also, just let me say, I agree absolutely with the, um, the first woman that talked from the European Union. She said, and I agree absolutely, that the right uh, of the human rights are almost the same offline and online. But, but let me agree, but let me say that are two new human rights that we need to spread them. That is one is right of connectivity. The right, the human, the internet as a human right. We need to spread this also as well as the uh, education in, uh, as well as the access to all the technology for everybody. Thank you very much. Mr. Jill, your uh, final one minute message, please. I'm a trained broadcaster, so I know how to do it very briefly. <laughs> we, we have to learn from you how to do it. I just want to emphasize what we're discussing is not esoteric. It's not academic. These are life and death issues, as we all know. I therefore just want to emphasize, and I think we're all in agreement, the collaboration is very important. The resources are critical and the accountability must be what drives us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And let me maybe build on what you just said when you said it's a matter of life or death. Uh, let me here quote uh, the ambassador of a member state of UNESCO who recently in a meeting with me told me, we see media and information literacy as a national security matter. Yeah. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, maybe uh, what, what I, I would like to end by echoing a comment that came through the, the chat. Uh, one participant, he said, I am Bengali and there are so many local languages that are not present online. So uh, clearly we know this. I mean, I think there are about 140, 150 languages that you can find in cyberspace, while uh, based on our latest study, more than 8,000 languages are out there. So when we talk about the digital divide, we think uh, giving computers to people or the financial affordability to subscribe to the internet, sometimes we overlook the linguistic divide or the linguistic barrier that people say you want to fight hate speech and disinformation, but how can you do it in my local language? You, you are not present uh, through a number of languages that maybe through them people spread hate speech, speech of violence, of radicalism, uh, and the like. Uh, let me also finish by saying that uh, on the question of uh, human rights online, I mentioned our Rome approach, human rights-based, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder. That's one contribution from us at UNESCO to, to, to really uh, call for a full respect for human rights 
in cyberspace. And on the language matter, uh, we are about to start the International Decade of Indigenous Languages at UNESCO, 2022-2032. And we just launched a couple of weeks ago the World Atlas of Languages, which has 8,300 languages that we uh, worked on. So clearly, we want to have an internet that is truly multilingual as well, because it can have then help education, it can help media and information literacy. Thank you all. Uh, I saw some really very positive feedback from participants saying this was an excellent discussion. Well, thank, thanks to you, the panelists, for sharing with us your perspectives, your insights, and your experiences. Until we see you again on a future UNESCO Amaya event, we wish you to stay safe, to be well, and we uh, Tell you happy holidays ahead of the holidays. Thank you and goodbye to all participants. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.